Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and this week we are going to talk about drafting blue-white in Crimson Vow. For any limited guru or above patrons on patreon.com slash drafting archetypes, the notes are up right now as I'm recording this, so you can pull those up and follow along if you wish. Full disclaimer, they are pretty short. I think that this archetype is really straightforward. So basically, I think that there is one way that I like to draft blue-white that I think is just like the right way to do it, and the decks will look different depending on what mix of the cards that you want you have. But I think that like you always want the same kind of things. And what those things are is cheap creatures, evasive creatures, and interaction. Um, you're basically playing a tempo deck where you're looking to establish a consistent clock that it's hard for your opponent to interact with. And slow them down, like force them to race and play cards that slow them down so that they can't race and uh, kill them with just like pesky little flyers. So that's it. We're done. <laughs> um, uh, like your best cards. I think the, the top two commons are probably Traveling Minister and Lantern Bearer. The stats don't quite support that. Specifically, the highest performing common in blue-white, and I say this slowly and with emphasis because it is not what I suspect basically anyone listening expects, is Nurturing Presence. The aura that makes a 1-1 one, one flying spirit and gives a creature plus one plus one whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control is the winningest common in blue-white on 17 lands right now. Is this me just like reading you some stats that you might not have noticed? No, I've actually played multiple blue-white decks with multiple nurturing presences, and they've consistently been absolutely great for me. So the, the stats actually support my experience here, which is that nurturing presence, which is taken later than 10th pick on average right now, and one of the least played cards in blue-white, is one of the most winning cards in the archetype. And it's a really, really important card because blue and white are really short on creatures that you actually want to play. So getting another good two drop is a really big deal in terms of increasing your win rate in blue white, especially one that's really, really powerful and synergistic with Brian Comer specifically, which is the blue-white uncommon, which if you're in blue-white and you're supposed to be in blue-white, there's a good chance you end up with one or more of those. And so the interaction actually matters. Also super, super good with another really high priority uncommon, which is the uh, blue one, two one flying drake that I'm not going to try to remember the name of that draws a card when uh, you target it. Honestly, if you take a single thing from this episode, just draft nurturing presences and put them in your deck. It doesn't matter when you take them. They'll just be there anytime for you in the pack and they're outstanding in blue white. Yeah, that's what's up. Literally just, you know, if your deck can be all traveling ministers, lantern bearers, nurturing presences, drug skull infantries, and then a few kindly ancestors, cruel witness, heron of hope, those are like all of the common creatures you want. Uh, so that's the 2-2 two, two, that when it dies, you can disturb into plus 2, plus 2. The 2-3 two, lifelink that you can turn into a lifelink aura. And then the 2-4 mana flyers. Cruel Witness is the 3-3 three, three that surveils when you cast a mountain creature. And Heron of Hope is the 2-3 flyer that you can give lifelink to. Those are basically the only common creatures you really want to play. There are you know some others that are like acceptable if you have to. But the stuff that looks like it would fit best, like... Binding Geist and the 2-1 Flying Training Guy aren't particularly good. They're like very, very filler type stuff. It's fine to play like the 3-3 Steel Clad Spirit or something, the 3-3 Defender that can attack if you played an Aura filler. You just want the good rate Evasive Creatures and uh, Kindly Ancestor, and then the rest of the deck, you want just as much good cheap interaction as possible as you can get, and there's a lot of it. So Fierce Retribution is like the best, and then uh, Sigarda's Imprisonment. I know I'm usually down on those. This format demands it. So Sigarda's Imprisonment, Siphon Essence, Syncopate, Chill the Grave, 
the uncommon bounce spell that draws a card. It's okay to have some cradle of safeties to you end up like, you know, after your like spirits die and then you play the disturb stuff, you end up kind of like moving all in on some random flying lifelink monstrosity bane slayer that you create. And so having a cradle of safety to make it bigger and protect it, or just like aggressively using cradle of safety on a brine comer, especially in conjunction with nurturing presence is like a fine piece of this puzzle. And then the last thing that's really good is scattered thoughts. Because you're, you want your curve to be really low, you want a lot of interaction, you can pass with counter spells up and instant speed card draw, uh, scattered thoughts, or the better uncommon, thirst for discovery. I've only drafted blue-white twice, I think. I went 7-0 and 7-2. Um, the 7-0 deck was more aggressive with more of the cheap creatures. The 7-2 deck was more controlling with more counter spells and like interaction but both followed the same script of just playing like these classes of cards in whatever mix was available and both decks felt really really good and it felt like a very reliable pattern where a lot of the cards you want aren't super high priorities for other people and i've had a lot of people recently ask me about like when do you want to play counter spells unlimited and the answer is the more instant speed stuff you can have and the more cheap creatures you can have, the better counter spells are. And this deck is just perfect for maximizing counter spells because you have like high impact cheap creatures. And by high impact, I mean they're low impact, but they're reliable impact because they have evasion. So it's hard for your opponent to brick your offense. And that means that they end up like your stuff has evasion, right? And so for them to stop you, they have to play some kind of creature that can block flyers. And because you have counter spells for like most of the stuff that blocks you well is kind of expensive, or you can use a combination of like Chill of the Grave and Sigarda's Imprisonment, potentially Fierce Retribution to answer their things that block flyers. It's very easy for you to like have enough interaction to stop all of their stuff that can actually generate virtual card advantage against your flyers, which means that your opponent needs to use removal on them. And when your opponent has to use removal on them, they're trading way, way, way down in tempo and stuff when they're trying to kill lantern bearers and traveling ministers and nurturing presence tokens and stuff with their removal spells. And when you get them in a spot where they're doing that, uh, casting like scattered thoughts is very easily backbreaking. Yeah, I've found that, it, especially in this format, that's so based on people just kind of like hanging out, playing interaction, trying to find and cast a bomb. If you're just like, here are a bunch of cards that your removal lines up badly against, and then just a ton of removal for the bombs that you're trying to resolve, you're just really well positioned against what people are doing in the format. It's the same spot, like differently, that Blue White was in last format, where Blue White was kind of just the foil to the natural thing that you wanted to do in the format. Here, the thing that you want to do in the format's a little bit better. The Blue White deck is a little bit different, but the Blue White deck is still a very consistent, reliable, and structurally sound natural predator to the natural forces of the format, specifically when those forces are play removal to answer your opponent's bombs and play your own bombs. The danger that you run into is what if my opponent is trying to go under people who are playing bombs and they're just playing aggressive stuff? I think I would guess, someone asked me last week about uh, like matchups and like who is good against who and stuff. I would guess that the deck that blue white doesn't want to play against is red green werewolves, wolves slash werewolves, because they have a bunch of like two mana, two and three power creatures that attack well into most of the stuff that blue white's doing and werewolves are awesome against instants because if you're trying to hold up a counterspell but your opponent played a werewolf you have to flip their werewolf which is obviously not what you want blue white can mitigate some of that by maximizing its cards that are good against attackers uh kindly ancestor fierce retribution cigar is imprisonment basically your white cards are pretty good against werewolves and your blue cards are very bad against werewolves except for 
the uncommon bounce spell uh, that's two mana to bounce a werewolf and you draw a card, which is obviously just an incredible rate for you, which is why that uncommon is, uh, I've almost never passed it. I, I've started probably more than three drafts in this format so far, and I have not drafted that many times by first picking that card. Yeah, I, I think that basically, like, understanding that structurally you're just like counter spells and wide cheap pressure is going to be really good against the normal just like rares and removal type decks so what you're afraid of is the aggro decks so you lean into like i'm going to play a kindly uh, ancestor they're going to like attack into it eventually and then maybe i'll cradle of safety to like win a combat and like eat their guy and gain a bunch of life or maybe i'll like suit up like you generally like the trend of oh I have lantern bearer plus drug skull infantry plus kindly ancestor is these things are gonna die in some order and they're gonna Voltron into some kind of bane slayer and if you make anything that vaguely resembles bane slayer angel that's going to be a very good card against blue against red green decks so it's not in any way hopeless if you play against red green or some other similar aggro deck which i guess is why i think the archetype is just really fundamentally strong and this is a place i'm happy to be very straightforward that's it <laughs> that's that's really all i have to uh this is my shortest lecture so far and it's not because i think the deck is like bad it's just it seems very clear to me that this is the way that you should approach it and I don't really think there's like another way outside of just like, well, how much of this stuff did I get versus how much of this stuff did I get? And then obviously any bombs that you have, you just throw them in there. There are a bunch of traps you can should avoid. Like don't put training cards in your deck because your deck is just all one and two power creatures and you're not going to be able to put any counters on them by training. But that's it. That There aren't that many cards you want to play, but the cards that you want go late enough that I think it's pretty easy to just like fill your deck with the key creatures and the interaction when it's open. At least it, that's worked so far for me. So going to turn this over to Twitch chat for questions. Thank you very much to uh, our newest on patreon.com slash drafting archetypes. Michael, thank you for your support. Anyone else who's interested in checking out stuff we offer supporting the program as always check out patreon.com slash drafting archetypes and hit me up with any questions you have if you think there's something more to this or other approaches you're interested in feel free to be like but what about this thing or any questions about details here someone's asking about cradle of safety and whether it's good in this archetype i mentioned it yeah i i do think that it's pretty good to have some of it. You can use it as just like additional pressure. You can protect the guys that you're in. Like it's somewhere between just like cheap pressure because it gives you that plus one plus one and interaction because it protects your threat, especially as you start investing into a single thing. Once you're in the Bane Slayer phase, it's very nice to have that to like protect your guy while doubling down on how scary it is. Does Hollowed Haunting have a home here? I would not draft this card early, but if I had a lot of spirits, I might be, like a lot of disturbed stuff, I might be willing to try it out. I'm guessing it has not performed well overall, but I would like to check. I'm guessing that since it's a mythic that's very hard to play and we're very early, we're not going to have a lot of stats for it. Okay, it's the stats actually indicate that it is it has been played very little, but it does have a like it doesn't have an amazing win rate. Its win rate is averageish for blue white in the format, which to me says if your deck is very very good for it, you sh can probably play it. But I would not advise taking this early and drafting around it because I can, it's very very easy to imagine it going wrong, and I don't think it's going to make your deck radically better to have it i think it'll just be functional if you have like a good deck for it next question is this a deck that consistently comes together at common or are you looking for a powerful uncommon or rare to get into the archetype so i would say that if you have all the commons then i like what the deck is doing but if you're not seeing the uncommons it means you're not you're also not going to see enough of the commons and there are a bunch of really good uncommons you want 
Lunar Rejection, which is the bounce spell that draws a card. You want Diver Scab, which is just the big exploit guy that's good in every deck. You want Brian Comer and Storm Chaser Drake, which are both point you in this direction specifically. Angelic Quartermaster is a reasonable extra like flyer to pressure them. And Circle of Confinement and Valorous Stances, Valorous Stance and Geist Light Snare are all like really good extra interaction. So, I mean, like just given the nature of drafting, I will usually start drafting this deck because I have uncommons, because there just are enough good uncommons in the set and the uncommons are better than the commons. And so like more often than not, I started drafting this because an uncommon like that, those, those are just the cards that I'm taking second or third that are defining what deck I'm playing. But it's not, you know, like I mentioned that like with exploit, like your deck needs to be driven by these like uncommon exploit cards and uh, uncommon enablers and stuff. And that like there are common cards that can fill in the gaps, but the commons aren't going to drive you here. Whereas like if for some reason I just like start taking the uh, blue and white one mana one ones, the lantern bearers and traveling ministers, and I just keep getting them, I'll be really happy with that deck. Like if I just have like four of each of those, I think I'm just going to beat people up. Where do you place the rare two blue draw three cleave? This question got a little messed up, I think. Uh, but anyway, I, I think that card's solid. I think that the instant speed card draw is likely better because you don't really want to tap out. But that card, I mean, like that card's very good when you don't have to cleave it and you want a low enough curve that it's pretty realistic to cast that card without cleaving it in this deck. What puts you in blue-white? Just high win rate cards. Like, I'm happy to take any of these kind of like flexible uncommons and commons. Like, so like Storm Chaser Drake is a card that you can take early because it's just like a generically good aggressive card, but it's a lot better in blue-white than not blue-white. So you would take it early and then you'd try to be blue-white, right? And like Lunar Rejection and Valorous Stance are just like blue and white cards that I take pretty aggressively. And then like I like, you know, Lantern Bearer and Traveling Minister and Nurturing Presence more than the average drafter and just like seeing and valuing those cards is reasonably likely to have me end up in blue white more than just like again because i think the deck when it's made out of just like multiple copies of the commons is one of the better decks to be in when you're seeing commons i'm less likely to need something in particular to put me here this isn't like there's some uncommon that i'm building the deck around i'm just like following this formula of cheap creatures cheap evasive creatures and interaction is Wandering Spirit good enough since it's sort of cheap with evasion? Basically, no. It only plays one way. That I, I'm, I'm assuming that's the name of the three mana, two, three flyer that can't block non-flyers. And I think it's just not a good enough card. Like the rate's not good. You don't really want to tap out on three for something that's like can't block. And you don't really need it to pressure people. It's just the wrong way. Like it, it, it's hearts in the right place, but the rate's just not good enough. Next question is, it seems like we're not too interested in four drop creatures in this deck, but if we have to play some, as I mentioned, the, the best ones are Cruel Witness and Heron of Hope. If you don't have those, some versions of the deck, it might be okay to play uh, the 3-3 three scab that exploits to get a spell back, but uh, most, mostly you're just looking for flyers. Is the Serpentine Ambush the trick that makes something a 5-5 five, five good in blue-white? I haven't wanted to play it. It doesn't seem like a good card to me. No, I'm, I'm just going to say no, but like it's it seems like it could be playable if you're like, you know, really desperate to ambush someone or something. I don't know it. it I don't think it's good. So the problem with it is your the creatures that you're attacking with are evasive, which means that they can't really block them very well. And when they're attacking you is when you'd want to use it. Uh, as like kind of a weak makeshift uh, fierce retribution, but trying to do that on your opponent's turn when they're attacking you is when they have mana up and you're trying to do it specifically on like a 1-1. One -one. When you're spending mana on a trick on your 1-1, one -one, any interaction they have is going to two for one you. And so it's a similar situation to like Wandering Spirit, where like structurally I can see why this would be like the kind of card you'd want, but it's just not a good enough card to play because you're setting yourself up for a two for one to get be on the wrong end of a two for one in too many spots. 
And it's very hard for you to like generate actual advantage of any kind with it. Next question. In a more controlling blue white dock where the tempo plan isn't as strong as you'd like, what do you think of leaning into discarding Heron Black Geist for the Lingering Souls value? Is that a powerful black backup strategy? No, I mean like if your deck doesn't come together and you're desperate, that's a thing you can do, but I don't know what you're discarding it to. Because like you don't have very many ways to make blood and by the time you can discard it, you'd probably rather cast it and then like have them kill it and then try to make some flyers. But the card is just like slow and clunky and expensive and has bad stats. And like you should be trying to just like, even if you don't have critical mass to pressure your opponent well, I would still rather just have like some small creature that can do it. If you really aren't seeing any of the like cheap creatures or any of the like evasive creatures, I just wouldn't want to put it in my deck. Um, I, I should just you should just be drafting something else. Suggestion that you can maybe discard it with Sell Off and Tumor. Legal play, not a card I want to put in my deck. If I'm at the point where I'm trying to combine Sell Off and Tumors and Heron Blast Geists to like as my strategy in my blue white deck, I feel like I'm in the wrong place. I should just be this is just a draft where I should be drafting other colors if I have to like dip that far down into quality and blue and white cards. Pack one, pick one, Katilda, force blue white. I'm gonna go with yes. Katilda in blue white has a 69.7% game in hand win rate and is just like beyond absurd. And it's like way better in blue white than anywhere else. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, like, you know, if it's not there, it's not there, but I'm certainly going to try to be blue white specifically. And I mean, I'm going to take, like, I'm going to try harder to be white than blue and try to be flexible into some other white deck if blue white's not available. But I would much rather be blue white than anything else. But I definitely want to be able to use the Katilda in general if I have it. So, yeah, like, if you can't play blue white, then your Katilda loses like four percent on average probably more than that because uh so katilda's overall win rate is 65 percent in blue white is 69 percent the 65 obviously includes when you're blue white which is going to be a reasonable portion of the time that you have it so its win rate is probably lower than that in other decks so you're giving up five percent plus uh if you can't position into blue white uh, when when you draw it, obviously. As far as like the overall uh, game played win percentage, so the deck is like fifty seven point nine, so basically fifty eight percent when Katilda's in your deck. Whereas like when Katilda's in a blue white deck, your deck is winning sixty one percent of the time on average, theoretically. You you so you'd certainly like to be able to end up blue white there. And obviously, Katilda is the best card in blue white, uh, though only marginally ahead of Wedding Announcement, which is just a yeah, amazing card. What other high rarity cards would push you strongly to try to get into blue white? So, I mean, obviously, just any good blue or white card, because I like blue white as a color combination. I think like pairing with the other one is a good way to use either of those colors. But Katilda specifically pushes that way. Wedding announcement, I think, also specifically pushes that way because an anthem is so good with your flyers. Uh, wedding announcement is the three mana enchantment that uh, has a million words on it, but basically makes a bunch of guys and or draws cards and then turns into Glorious Anthem. I'm not going to read all those words, though. Uh, Welcoming Vampire is also amazing in blue-white since you want to play low-power, cheap creatures that fly just, like, completely perfectly on plan. You also, like, are playing a lot of one-for-ones, so the card drawing that you're getting out of it really matters great home for that faithful judge uh dream shackle geist um are just like other three mana flying rares that are just like really really good pressure perfectly what you want to do so yeah basically just like the the really good cheap blue and white cards are where i would want to you know try to be this specifically whereas like something like hullbreaker horror that's just a good blue card. There's no particular reason I'd want to pair that with white. I'm happy to play it with absolutely anything, and I don't think I care at all what the second color is. So, gonna wrap it up there. Um, one of my shortest episodes of all time. Hopefully, short and sweet. Condensed all of the 
lessons into a tight little package. Should be good to go on playing this archetype and doing it right, I hope. So thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week to talk about something or other. Figure it out later. Thanks, and bye for now.